Dr. McMahon is a researcher at one of the most foremost research institutions of the world. That's the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I'd like to ask you, Dr. McMahon, that would you please tell us some of your current research, what it's about and what the implications are? Sure, I'd be glad to. We're still trying to understand more about the genetic risk factors for bipolar disorder so that we can better understand what causes the illness and develop better treatments. To do this, we're using methods known as genome-wide association studies that actually allow us to scan the entire genome with genetic markers spread across all the chromosomes. We're also using new technologies known as next-generation sequencing that might allow us to identify actual changes in individual genes that might confer a substantial risk of bipolar disorder in unusual cases. Another important use of genetic technology like this is to actually identify uh, better ways to match patients with the treatments that will work best for them. This is something known as precision medicine or pharmacogenetics. Here we use genetic markers to identify people who are at risk for having side effects from a treatment and ultimately uh, to identify patients who are most likely to respond to a particular kind of treatment. Most recently we did a study like this looking at response to the drug lithium uh, for bipolar disorder. Now lithium is a, a, a medication that's used as a mood stabilizer in people with bipolar disorder because it evens out the extreme highs and lows that people with the illness can experience and may actually prevent episodes of mania or depression over time. But lithium doesn't work for everyone, and in fact about two-thirds of people who are treated with lithium don't have a complete response, meaning that they continue to have episodes of mania or depression. And some people who take lithium find no benefit from it at all. If we could figure out a way to predict in advance who would do best with lithium, then that might save other people uh, the time and trouble of trying a medication that ultimately won't work for them. In order to find these kinds of markers, we had to organize a very large uh, sample of patients with bipolar disorder who had been treated with lithium and for whom we could get a reliable rating of whether they responded well to lithium or not. We did this in collaboration with researchers around the world who contributed DNA samples and clinical information to what we called the Consortium on Lithium Genetics. Once we had assembled about 3,000 such individuals, we were able to use the genome-wide marker technology that I mentioned earlier to scan the genome for markers that were more common in people who responded well to lithium and less common in people who didn't. We were able to find a group of markers on chromosome 21 that were much more common in individuals who responded well to lithium. Now it's important with these kinds of tests to check to make sure that they are not uh, uh, what we false leads uh, that might arise from unknown problems in the experiment. So in order to test this, we looked at an independent group of patients who had been followed uh, over time while taking lithium for up to two years. And in those individuals, we also found that people who carried the good response markers tended to relapse and have additional episodes of mania or depression more slowly than people who carried the other markers. Now, unfortunately, uh, the, 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 the markers are, are, are not, um, don't identify uh, very many people who will, who will respond poorly to lithium only about 5%. So uh, they're probably not going to be useful uh, in the clinic in the near future. But they do give us some clues as to the ways in which lithium works. Some of the genes that are turned on and off by lithium and might allow us to get a deeper understanding of how lithium uh, works for some people and doesn't work for others in the future.